Boy, growing up, some of this may be foreign, foreign to some of you, what I'm about to talk about, but uh, when I was a little boy growing up, I was involved in 4-H and FFA. All right, I grew up on a farm, and my, my uncle was the ag teacher at uh, Hugo, and, and there in Hugo, and so I really had uh, not a, very many options. I mean, I was going to be in 4-H and FFA. That's just the way it was. Now, I wanted to be. Now, when I grew, how many of y'all even know what I'm talking about? 4-H, F, okay, praise the Lord. All right, good. Okay, goodness gracious. I want to make sure y'all didn't think I was baking cookies or selling gingerbread things door to door. Okay, all right. Now, I, I don't have a problem if anybody does that, all right? But uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about showing pigs and lambs and, all right. But when I grew up, I used to show pigs. Now, I, I would almost bet that that's the first time that that's ever been mentioned from this pulpit. Amen. That's a first. But yeah, I used to show pigs and lambs and, and uh, my sister and I, and I. And I can remember one year in particular. I was tired of showing pigs. I was tired of showing lambs. And I wanted to show, I wanted to show a calf. I wanted to show a, a heifer. And so I begged with my dad. And I said, Dad, please let me show a calf this year. I'm tired of pigs. I'm tired of lambs. Lord, I want to take it up a notch. I want to show, I want to show a calf. And so he finally gave in to my pleading, and we traveled to Basel, Oklahoma, <laughs> right next to Soper, and everybody knows where that is, right? <laughs> and we bought a show cap. As a matter of fact, let, let's go ahead and pull that up on the screen there. That's not a mullet, okay? That's, uh, <laughs> it's not a mullet. If it was short, uh, in the top and long in the back, then it would be a mullet. It's the same length all over. So, but uh, but there's a picture. You like that, don't you, Lon? I could say something about you right now, but I'm not going to do that. Okay? But uh, but but as you, there's there I am with my father. Okay? There's Dad, myself. We're at the we're at the uh, Agriplex there in Hugo, and I'm getting ready, get my get my show heifer ready for the show. Now here's an invaluable lesson that I learned. And it still applies today, and it's something that I want to share with you. Is that personal privileges, personal privileges in, in a great experience also carries with it great stewardship responsibility. Okay? When God blesses you with the opportunity to participate in something great, a great privilege, great stewardship responsibility comes along with that. And that's the reason that I wanted to show that picture. You see me there with the blow dryer. I'd, I'd already, I, I had already washed the heifer. I'd already, now I'm blow drying the heifer. And then we're going to have to cut her hair and get her ready for the show. And I also had to teach her how to lead. And I had to take care of her every day. And so, yes, it was a great privilege for, for me to have a show heifer. But I soon learned that that great privilege carried with it huge stewardship responsibilities. Now, that's really the theme that I want us to think about. I want you to think about that phrase with me. So I want to say it again to make sure that it sinks in to your heart and your mind. So let me say it. The blessing of participating in great experiences carries with it great stewardship responsibilities. Are you getting that? You might want to write that down, okay? That's a life lesson that I've learned, and it's true, and it's also biblical truth. Now, this morning, we start a new series in, in the book of Acts entitled The Unhindered Gospel. And so I would like for you to open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11, okay? So Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and the title of this morning's message is Evangelistic Motivation evangelistic motivation. So as I preach through this sermon, I want you to remember that, that phrase. The blessing of experiencing great privileges carries with it great stewardship responsibility. And I will say to us this morning, those of us who are saved, we have all been blessed to share in a great experience. Amen? There is no experience greater than knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There is no experience greater than being blessed with the gift of eternal life. There is no experience greater than knowing that your sin has been forgiven and that eternal life in heaven is yours. There is no experience greater 
than having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But the thing that I want us to understand this morning is that great privilege carries with it great stewardship responsibilities. Amen? So let's look there. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And this is what Luke writes. Luke says, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about, the, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now I want you to notice that word began. If you have a pen with you or, or something, you'd want to underline or circle that word began there in verse 1. He says, so I'm writing to you, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And after he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, at this time are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while he was going, they were gazing into heaven. And suddenly two men in white clothes stood before them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Let me say that again. This Jesus who has been taken from you will come again or taken up into heaven, will come again in the same way that you have seen him going. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom and insight. I pray for our hearts to be receptive. For I pray for our minds to be attentive. Lord, I pray that we would receive the word of God this morning as the word of God and not as the word of man. I pray for those who need to be saved this morning to surrender their lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, remind us all this morning that great privileges carry with them great stewardship responsibilities. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to do just, just briefly, I want to do a little bit of background work just to make sure that we understand this passage of Scripture. We want to make sure that we get started in the right foot as we're going to be in the book of Acts for uh, several months, okay? Uh, possibly a year, I, I don't know, but uh, we'll see how that works. But this is written, Acts was written by, by Luke, the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke, or the, the Gospel according to Luke, same guy. And the reason we know it's the same guy is because throughout the book of Acts, he refers to himself as we, as, a, as if he's with Paul, and he was with Paul. So we know that this was written by Luke, and we know it was written to a Gentile man by the name of Theophilus. He says, I wrote the first narrative. Now this would be a second. The book of Acts would be the second book that he has written. The first book is what? The Gospel of Luke. He says, so I wrote the first narrative, the Gospel of Luke, to you, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So the Gospel of Luke, follow me for a moment, the Gospel of Luke is all about what Jesus began to do and teach. So the Gospel of Luke is not the complete record of Jesus' ministry. That word began lets us know that. So what Luke is telling us is that in the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ, which continues on today. Now we know, now follow me for, for a moment, in the gospel of Luke, we know that we have the account of Jesus' birth in the gospel of Luke. 
born of a virgin there in the town of Bethlehem. We have an account of Jesus' earthly ministry. He called his disciples, he healed the sick, he raised the dead. Jesus performed all these miracles. We read that in the Gospel of Luke. Then we come to the Gospel of Luke and we also find that Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was ultimately crucified, nailed to a cross. And we learn from the Gospel of Luke that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for the sins of the world. We also learn from Luke that Jesus Christ was taken down off the cross, placed in a tomb. And three days later, he rose from the dead. So in the Gospel of Luke, we learn about the birth of Jesus. We learn about the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. And we learn about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We also learn something else about Jesus. We also learn that after Jesus had risen from the dead, that he spent 40 days on earth before he ascended into heaven where he is right now. And so now Luke comes to us in Acts, and he says, he's writing to the same guy, Theophilus, and he says, listen, I wrote the first narrative, Luke, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now I'm writing the book of Acts to tell you what Jesus is continuing to do. Some people would say, well, wait a minute, Jesus isn't on the earth when Acts was written. I mean, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. Isn't the ministry of Jesus over? No, because what we have in the book of Acts is we have Jesus going to heaven and we have the Holy Spirit descending from heaven on the day of Pentecost. And there on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, indwelt every true believer. And so now we are all indwelt by the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God. So Jesus Christ is not physically walking on the earth any longer. But Jesus and his ministry continues. His ministry continues through the person of the Holy Spirit and the church. Jesus Christ continues to work through the Spirit in his church in order to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so that's what we find in the book of Acts. We find the continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And his ministry continues on to this day. We also learn in the book of Acts that the gospel cannot be hindered. The gospel crosses ethnic, religious, and geographical boundaries. The gospel was not hindered to the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. But the gospel continues to go forth. And every true believer is called to be a witness of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. And so that's what we find here in the book of Acts. We find the continuation of the ministry of Jesus through the Spirit and through his church. We also find the theme of the gospel going forward. And when the gospel is preached and when the gospel is shared without hindrance, it results in multiplication. And we see that throughout the book of Acts. That's why we as a church, we want to be faithful to the gospel. We want to be faithful to the gospel. You know why? Because we want to see people saved. And when we are faithful to preach the gospel, and when we are faithful to share the gospel, the true gospel with integrity, it results in multiplication. It results in people's lives being changed for the glory of Almighty God. Now, I shouldn't have to preach that very long for those of us who've been saved, because we know that our lives have been changed. Amen? My, my life has been changed, and my life has changed because of the gospel. And listen, the reason I'm saved is because Jesus through the person of the Holy Spirit, drew me unto salvation. Jesus is still at work. And Jesus is at work in me. And Jesus is at work in you. And Jesus is at work in his church in order to cause the gospel to flourish. And when we are faithful to the gospel, the gospel will flourish. Some would say, well, why is the gospel not flourishing today in so many churches? Well, the answer is not Jesus. Jesus is not to blame. The gospel is not to blame. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If the gospel is not flourishing in a church, if the gospel is not flourishing in a town, if the, go if the gospel is not flourishing in a certain region, it's because the people of God are being unfaithful to the gospel. Well, I didn't get very many amens on that one. Huh? So, we talk about evangelistic motivation. What is it in this passage of Scripture, what is it that we find here that will motivate us 
to be faithful to evangelism. We are to be good stewards of the gospel. When you have been blessed with a great privilege, the great privilege carries with it great stewardship responsibilities. We have been saved by the gospel. As a result of the gospel. And now we have a responsibility to be good stewards of that gospel. The question is, is are you being a faithful steward? Are you being a faithful steward of the gospel? Well, I'd like to provide us this morning with some motivation to be faithful from this passage. If we go back to our passage there, he says, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After he suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. So after Jesus' resurrection, he presented himself to his disciples, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom. And so Jesus, during that 40-day period, was coming and going, interacting, interacting with his disciples, proving to them that he had risen from the dead bodily. Now, verse 4, while he was together with them, this is after his resurrection, before his ascension, while he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. And literally in the Greek, it reads this way, stop leaving Jerusalem. <laughs> so apparently the disciples were coming into Jerusalem and they were leaving. They would come and go, they would come and go, they would come and go. Now Jesus says to them, stop doing that. Stay here. Stop leaving Jerusalem. Stay here. Stay in Jerusalem. Verse 4. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Why? But to wait for the Father's promise. This he said, This is what you heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is telling them, Listen, you need to stay in Jerusalem until you are filled with the Spirit of God, until you are indwelt with the Spirit of God. You need to stay in Jerusalem until you are baptized with the Spirit of God. Because the task that lies before you, you can't do all by yourself. The task that lies before you is too great for you to try to accomplish in your own strength. As a matter of fact, if you try to accomplish it in your own strength, you're going to fail. And so he says, you need to wait in Jerusalem until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus says this to them. Now, here's something that the disciples know. The disciples know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a prerequisite to the setting up of the kingdom of God. They understand that. And so when Jesus talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming, they naturally respond by saying, Lord, if you look there at your Bibles, verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? You see, the disciples are still not getting it. Before Jesus was crucified, they, they were looking for a political Messiah. Someone who would come and overthrow the Romans and give the nation of Israel physical dominance here upon the earth. But after the death, after the crucifixion of Jesus, they kind of gave up on that idea of a political kingdom. But now Jesus is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and so they realize, okay, we understand the political things out the window. But are, is it at this time that you're going to set up your kingdom here on earth? Huh, Jesus, right now are you going to make the nation of Israel? Right now are you going to establish the nation of Israel? Right now are you going to set up your kingdom? Right now at this time are you going to establish your chosen people, us, the Jews, the nation of Israel? Now Jesus does not rebuke them because it's, an, it's a logical question. God is going to restore the nation of Israel. The Lord is going to reign physically upon the earth. And they will reign with him, and so will all those who have been chosen unto the Lord, those who are saved. We will, so it's a logical question. But they're hung up on times. Is it at this time when you're going to do it? Notice their focus. Their focus is on times, and their focus is on what? The nation of Israel. They have a national 
focus. Their focus is limited to the nation. They still believe that the kingdom of God is just for the nation of Israel. They do not have a global focus. Now Jesus during that 40 days had been speaking to them about the kingdom. Throughout his ministry, he had been speaking to them about the kingdom. So it's a logical question. Therefore, Jesus does not rebuke them, but he does help them to gain true biblical perspective. Jesus says to them, verse 7, It is not for you to know times or periods. Stop focusing, literally, stop focusing upon times. Is it at this time? Stop focusing upon times and periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So now Jesus is telling them, take your eyes off of the nation and realize that the kingdom of God is going to consist of people from all over the world. The kingdom of God is not just for the Jew. The kingdom of God is for the Gentile. The kingdom of God will be made up of people from every tribe, tongue, and language. And Jesus says, listen, and the only way this kingdom is going to be established here on earth is for you to go out and preach the gospel. The gospel is the door into the kingdom of God. Now the Lord, now notice this, they wanted the kingdom to be set up right then. They wanted Jesus to establish his kingdom at that moment. But Jesus tells them, listen, I'm going to establish my kingdom, and this is my paraphrase because he did not rebuke them. I'm going to establish my kingdom. I'm going to come again. But the gospel must first be preached to the world before I come. Because the gospel is not just for you. It's for everybody. So listen, folks. The surest The quickest, let me put it this way, the quickest way for us as the church to help usher in the second coming of Jesus is to be faithful to the gospel. Not just here, but around the world. Because the Lord is not going to return at his second coming. The Lord is not going to return until the gospel has been preached to the world. And there are still millions upon untold millions who have still yet to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have a great task ahead of us. When we think about the catching up, we know that Jesus can return at any moment. Some refer to that as the catching up. Some refer to it as the rapture of the church. Now listen, here's what I know. I know that Jesus Christ can return at any moment to call his church. But as far as the second coming is concerned... Before Jesus comes and sets up his reign here physically upon this earth, the kingdom must first be preached to the nations. The gospel must first be preached to the nations of the world. Let me share with you, and these will go briefly because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Four things that will help motivate us to be faithful to the gospel. Number one is to realize that every believer is under the authority of the creator. Every believer is under the authority of the creator. And we see that here in the passage. The Bible says, the the disciples said, Lord, is it at this time you're going to set up his kingdom? And the Lord said, listen, it's not for you to know that. It's not for you to know the times that God has set by his what? By his own authority. Listen, it's not for you to know. You know why? Because you're under his authority. So since you're under his authority, this is the implication, since you're under his authority, stop wondering about times and start spreading the gospel. And the same is the same for us today. We are under the authority of the Creator. Therefore, let us stop spending our time worrying about the non-essentials and let's be faithful to invest our time here on earth to the spreading of the gospel because this is what God has called us to and we are under his authority. 
Are you getting that? That's motivation, isn't it? I want to be faithful to the gospel. You know why? Because he's God, I'm not. I want to be faithful to the gospel because he's the creator, I'm the created. I want to be faithful to the gospel because he's my father and I'm his child. I want to be faithful to the gospel because he's master, I'm the servant. Are you getting the picture? I am under his authority and he has called me to be faithful to the gospel. Therefore, that motivates me to want to honor him and to show him the reverence that he deserves. He says, stop worrying about the non-essentials. Stop worrying about times and epics and all those things. Realize that God is the one who knows those things and you are under his authority. So just be faithful to do what God has called you to do. Stop worrying about the non-essentials and the things that you can't figure out and be faithful to the things that you have figured out. Amen? <laughs> so number two, every believer has been equipped by the comforter. Jesus says that when he would leave that the comforter, the parakletos in the Greek language, the comforter, that when he would leave the comforter would come. Who is the comforter? The Holy Spirit. What does this passage say? Talking to every believer. Listen to me, young people. Talking to every believer. He says, you will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you. So if you're saved, that means the Spirit has come upon you. Therefore, the power of God is in you. The same power that was in Christ is in you. The same power that was in Paul's in you and Peter's in you. The same power that's in me is in you. We've been empowered by the comforter. What motivation? Man, I'm under his authority and he's equipped me. He's given me the power to serve him. What is the purpose of the power? He says you will receive power when the Spirit of God has come upon you. It's power for effective evangelism. In other words, when I am faithful to, sh to share the gospel, people are going to be saved. You know why? Because God has made my witness effective through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we are faithful, now listen, you may share the gospel with, the, with, with 50 people and no one received the Lord. That's okay, you're still victorious. We win when we're faithful to share. We're victorious when we're faithful to share. It's God's business to lead those who hear to make a decision for Jesus. But we're to be faithful. But here's the thing I know. I know that if I'm faithful to share, that people are that people will be saved as a result of my witness because the power of God lives in me and his power makes my witness effective. Without his witness, without his power, there would be no effectiveness in my witness. Are you getting that? So get this. Some of you say, well, I don't have a testimony like you, Pastor. I don't have a testimony like you. I was saved when I was a little kid, and I've lived for the Lord all my life. You know, what? you've got this great testimony of all this stuff. and have a, Listen, it doesn't matter about your testimony. It doesn't matter if you were saved when you were 16, or if you were saved when you were 6, or if you were saved when you were 55. The power is not in the, the, the details of your testimony. The power is in the person who has caused you to have a testimony. Amen? And so your testimony is effective. The gospel is effective. You have been empowered by the comforter. You have been thoroughly equipped to be an effective witness for the Lord. You are not lacking anything that you need to be a witness for him. Just get busy. Get to work. Be faithful. Be courageous. Number three, every believer has been commissioned by Christ. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Literally, you're going to be the ones who give testimony of me. He says, you will be my witnesses. Now, we're talking about evangelistic motivation, right? Number one, I'm under the authority of the Creator. Oh, man, I'm His. I belong to Him. Number two, I've been equipped, empowered by the Comforter. I've got the Spirit of God in me. My witness is effective. Number three, I've been commissioned by Christ. The very one who came and died for me upon the cross is the very one who has commanded me to go out and be a witness. How can I say no to him? 
Are you getting that? How can I say no to the one who died in my place? How can I say no to the one who shed his blood? How can I say no to the one who bore my sin? You know the answer. We can't say no, but yet we do. But that's why we need to hear sermons like this, right? We have all, if you're saved, we've all been commissioned by Christ. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. It didn't say you might be. You will be. The question is, is what type of witness are you? What type of witness? You're either a good witness or you're a poor witness. What type of witness are you? The fourth thing that we see here is every believer, every believer should be inspired by his coming. The Bible says that after Jesus said those words to them, he said, listen, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. And then the Shekinah glory of God, the manifest presence of the Lord encompassed Christ in a cloud. The same cloud that dwelt there in the Holy of Holies in the temple. It encompassed Christ and Christ ascended. He ascended into heaven. And the disciples are just sitting there looking and they're watching. Looking and staring. And then the angels appear and say, listen, why do you men stand here gazing? I like that. Why would the angels say that? Because the Lord just gave them a command, didn't he? Why are you standing here gazing? The one whom you saw go into heaven is going to come again in the same way. So let us be inspired by his coming to be faithful witnesses of the gospel. Jesus is coming. And on that day, we will have to stand before the Lord and we will have to give an account for our faithfulness or lack thereof. As I look out across this auditorium and sanctuary, I see college students, I see high school students, I see junior high students, and I say to you, your school campus, as you prepare to go back to school, your school campus is your mission field. God has placed you there to be a witness. Not to be a part of cliques, but to be his witness. Not to live life for yourself, but to be his witness. Not to be a partier, but to be his witness. And you ought to be inspired. Listen to me, young people. You ought to be inspired to be a witness for the Lord because, listen, he's your creator and you're under his authority. If you're saved, he's given you the power to witness and make it effective. The very one who saved you is the very one who has commanded you to go. And then lastly, he's coming again. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. He's coming again. So what are you going to do in the meantime? Are we going to stand looking, gazing into heaven as the world dies and goes to hell around us? Stand gazing and looking? Or are we going to be about, or, or are we going to be about the Father's business? To be faithful to the task at hand. I started this sermon by saying this. The blessing, the blessing of participating in great experiences, the privilege of participating in great experiences carries with it great stewardship responsibility. If you're saved this morning, that's the greatest privilege. And now you have a stewardship responsibility that's great. And that is to be a witness of the gospel. I close with this last illustration. Don't package up on me. Just listen, okay? I'm not a big movie watcher, but I did catch the end of a classic last night. Schindler's List. And there's a portion at the end of that movie that, move, movie that just grips your heart. If you don't know anything about the movie Schindler's List, it's, 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 uh, it it's, uh, finds itself, it's a, it's a true story about a man by the name of, um, what's his, uh, uh, Oscar Schindler, who is a German, a part of the Nazi 
uh, movement and owned a huge factory that were employed by thousands of Jews. Well, during World War II, we know that Hitler did everything that he could to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. Well, Schindler wanted to do everything that he could do to save his Jewish employees. And so Schindler, a very wealthy man, began to bribe all the Nazi, Nazi officials. Because if he didn't bribe them, they were going to take these workers of his to the concentration camps and then ultimately to the gas chamber. And so he began to sell everything. He began to take all of his money that he had and he began to bribe the Nazi officials and he also began to buy, buy as many Jews as he could to work in his ammunition factory. He ended up having over a thousand Jews, Jewish employees, employed there at his factory. At the end of the movement, move me, the Jews are liberated. And they're all standing there in the factory. And Oscar Schindler walks out and he sees all thousands of, about 1,200 Jews that were saved as a result of his investment in their lives. But then all of a sudden he begins to weep. Because he looked at his cars, and he'd already, listen, he'd already gone bankrupt. He, he didn't have any money left. Very wealthy man, no money left. But then he saw his car sitting there. And he said, if I only would have sold my car, why did I keep my car? If I just would have sold my car, I could have saved ten more, ten more lives. Why did I keep my car? I could have saved just ten more and then he had a gold pin on his jacket. And he took the gold pin off. He said, pure gold, pure gold. Why did I keep this pin? Why did I hang on to this pin? If I just would have sold this pin, I could have saved two more, two more lives, two more. And he began to weep because he realized even though all that he had done, he could have done just a little bit more more to save one more my question to you this morning is what are you willing to do to reach just one more just one more just one more if we're saved what a great privilege but listen friend we've got a great stewardship responsibility amen I'm going to ask if you would to bow your heads this morning in prayer And first, I want to address those here this morning, those who are not saved. To be honest, there are some people here who have never truly trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've walked an aisle, maybe you've been baptized, but you've never been born again. Let me ask you a question. If you were to die today and you were to stand before Jesus and he said, why should I, why should I let you into heaven? Do you have an answer? If you were to die today or if Jesus were to return today, do you have the assurance that you would be with him? Dear friend, do not leave this place this morning in doubt. Do not leave this place this morning lost. Here in a moment, we're going to give an invitation and we're going to give you an opportunity to walk from that balcony down these steps to this front aisle. And I want to pray with you. And by coming, you're saying, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want to be saved. I haven't lived for him. I'm not living for him. But I'm tired of living for myself. I need Jesus to save me. I want to live my life for him. Would you come this morning and repent of your sin? and Believe upon Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Invite him into your life. He'll cleanse you of your sin. Would you come? Here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and I want you to come. Others of you need to come and you need to say, just bow and say, Lord, use my life to reach just one more. Young people, as you go back to school, would you come and say, Lord, help me to be a witness. Help me not to get so distracted by all the school events that I, it's okay to be a part of sports and all the school activities. It's okay, but listen, don't lose focus of why you're there. 
you may be the captain of this or the captain of that, or you may be a part of this club or that club, but your life is not about being a captain of this or a part of a club. Your life is about being a witness for Jesus while you participate in those things. And so would you come and ask the Lord to help you to be faithful to your witness, to be a good steward of the great privilege that he has entrusted you with. Why are we starting a new campus? Why? So we can reach just one more. Just one more. Just one more before the Lord returns. And we need your help and we need your prayers. So would you come and pray that God would use us to reach as many people as we can as we anticipate his return. Lord, may you move in power among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and begin to come as the Lord leads? Would you come?